again, not to be on purpose or repetition, repetitious, but I know that things will be controversial. <laughs> and, and that's not out of purpose, it's just that out of the things we've been taught, seeing things we haven't been taught. You know, and did, and did you know, I always say, did you know at the first council of the church, 326 Nicaean Council, did you know that they uh, took out the book of Enoch from what was compiled in the canons at that point in time? And one of the reasons they took, how many of you ever read the book of Enoch? Y'all ever, anybody ever seen the book of Enoch? The book of Enoch is so metaphysical. It's so, um, it's so out there. There was no way they could manipulate it and change the wordings ah. in it to, uh, to it sound like put, history. yeah, they could not because, because the book of Enoch is uh, about angels and all these things that are not natural, uh. but things that are put together in spiritual language that are not ever meant to be natural. In other words, the book of Enoch is, uh, is a book that you can't take literally, period, and they knew that. And let me give you this uh, also. At that time, there was a lot of argument in putting the book of Revelation in the canon. So it was not in the canon. It was not compiled in Scripture at all, the book of Revelation. It wasn't even a part of what you would call the Bible. It wasn't there, even though it was recognized in the churches and read in the churches. Until the 6th century, the Council of Five, I think five, 556 or somewhere, I can't remember the, the name of that council. But at that time, they had had several hundred years to manipulate the book of Revelation and added the book of Revelation to the canon. Hmm. Now, how many of you have ever heard this phrase that, that every word in this book has been inspired by God and it's not to be added to or taken away. Did you know that's only in the book of Revelation at the close of that book and only referred to the book of Revelation? Didn't refer to the other books in the Bible. It had, no, it had nothing to do with the books in the Bible. It had to do with that book, this book, the book of Revelation. Because at that time, compiling a canon like we have and we call this the Bible, that was, that was not done putting together right. a book and calling it an old covenant versus a new covenant was not done. That right. was done by the church mm -hmm. during its councils of trying to twist and manipulate, take out, mm -hmm. take out canon, take out this, take out this scroll, that, that scroll, until they would come up with uh, what, they, what they could work with. And since that time, even the early years, since... Uh, First and second, third and fourth, fifth, sixth councils, they have still changed and twisted a lot that's in this book, taken mm -hmm. away from it, added to it. I mean, I always tell people, I realize that is controversial if I'm speaking to a Christian. You know, if I'm, if I'm especially if I'm at the First Baptist Church <laughs> or whichever one, that's really controversial because they have been taught, oh, this is holy, this is inspired. And, uh, you go to saying things like that, they think you're tampering with that. I, I mean, I, I preached at a church in Indianapolis, Indiana back in, a, in the mid-80s, early mid-80s, and they had in front of the, the pulpit was up on a platform, as most of them are, mm -hmm. and then down on the platform in front of the pulpit, they had this table, this doing remembrance of me, and that was a communion table. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so back then, I didn't like to get behind the cage up there, especially if I was speaking at another church, so I would always ask the pastor if they had one of these, and can I get down here with the people where I can be among the people? Because that then I'd, I'd walk and talk and teach, you know, didn't use a board as much. And they said, oh yeah, and so I was I was preaching and sharing, and, and that, this doing remembrance to me, sacred table was back there, and I backed up to it, and I just kind of leaned back on it like that, oh. you know, while I'm sharing. Oh, oh I did. I mean, I touched the sacred cow. It was it caused some friction in that because of what I just that. So see, we have taught we have been taught so many things that aren't 
that have nothing to do with Scripture, have nothing to do with God, it has nothing to do with your holiness or your lack of holiness. Hmm. None of those things. We've been taught a lot of clothesline religion, and yeah. that, that stuff is, it's never served humanity and never will serve humanity. And so again, what I say as controversy is not just me saying it, it's the way that it's been translated or been put together. And when we see it, as we see it, then we can understand it. it it's controversial. And so I've always had people say, well, you, you know things or you, you see things that you aren't sharing. I said, yeah, that's simply because it's here a little, there a little, line upon line. That's true for all of us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't really share everything that you would with the first, second, third grade that you would in the fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, and etc. You can, you don't. And even if you do, you have to just share bits and pieces. That, you know, like used to, used to back before any of us ever come along, 100, 150 years ago, the classroom was made up of the first grade all the way through the twelfth grade. Yeah. They were all in one room. Mm -hmm. They weren't. They weren't broke up. They were all in one room. So you had to have a teacher that understood diversity so that you can you can give milk to the babes and you can give meat to the elders. And so you have to so you have to consider all these things. So saying all that, I want you to open your Bible again to Hebrews, but in on your way over to the book of Hebrews, stop in the middle of the Old Testament to the book of Hosea. And uh, and that is one of the minor prophets in the in, right before you get to Matthew. And, if you find Daniel, if you can find the book of Daniel, it's, sometimes that's easier because a lot of people know where Daniel's at. Hosea's just right next door to Daniel, going toward Matthew, going toward the New Testament. So find Hosea, and, uh, and this, is a, this is a somewhat familiar passage of Scripture for most of us, I'm sure. If, if not, I'm sure you've all heard this passage of Scripture quoted. Hosea chapter 4. Oh, hallelujah. Mm -mm -mm. God's good, isn't it? Amen. 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 Hosea, did you find it? Hosea chapter 4. Everybody got that little book there? It's, like I said, I know it's stuck together. But Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed. You see that? Yeah. Why? For lack of knowledge. Exactly. So, does knowledge play an important part? in our being. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. You either are or not because of knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's the things that you know or don't know are the things that will make you. Then I want you to look at another, just on that same book, just on the, probably the same page, chapter 6. Same book. Hosea chapter 6. Mm -hmm. For I desire what? Mercy. mercy. I desire mercy and not what? Sacrifice. Now you think about that. Did God want to sacrifice Jesus? Was that a plan of God? Or was that some kind of an offshoot plan? God makes it clear. I'm not interested in blood sacrifices. I'm not interested in, in bulls and goats or whatever. I'm not interested in your sacrifices. I mean, you. I'm sorry, I can take you to so many places and show you that has never been a part of the will of God. Now we have been, we have been taught hundreds and hundreds of years of this thing that uh, that we have a deep conviction of. And again, I, I've mentioned that so many times. These things are so deep in us that for me to touch them, sometimes very offensive to people. They get, they get mad. You know, you're going to try to take away this. You're trying to take away my Jesus. Honestly, I am not trying to take away anything from you. If anything, I want to put Jesus in the proper place in you so that you can respect it and understand it far greater than you ever have. Amen. And once you do, and when you do, you realize he's a mirror of you. So when yes. you look in the mirror, you see Jesus. And if you can ever learn that, you can ever understand that, you realize that you are the begotten daughter, Amen. son of God. Yes. Makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. And so I'm not trying to take anything away from anybody. I really am trying to add to what you already have. And actually, I can't add to it anyway. I'm just trying to give it to you in an order where you can assimilate it and put it in yourself. Notice this again. I didn't write it. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than your burnt offerings. Mm -hmm. Now I realize it's difficult for us because we go back and we, we just revere these things so much. But many times we're revering a lie. And we've honored a lie. 
And we call it the truth and we're willing, we're willing to fight for it. We're willing to, in some cases, to say, well, I'll die for that. And, and, and I, you know, I understand the conviction of that. I do. I understand it because you have to remember, I have, I have given all of my adult life to the service of this book and to the study of this book. So for the last 45 years, I have spent most of my life studying this book and working a job, running a business. So, uh, and, and not trying to rob people through giving me an offering. I've, yeah. never, I've never tried to do that. I, I don't even actually believe in that. I, I think, I tell preachers, you ought to be like the Apostle Paul, you need to get you a job. <laughs> yep. uh, yeah. If you think that you're going to just live off the fat of the lamb, mm -hmm. and they do. Anyway, there you go. So, I realized the controversy in that, I didn't invent that, I didn't write that, it just is what it is. So, <laughs> Go with me now to Hebrews chapter 10 and we will jump in from here and see what we got here. Verse 5 says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body. Everybody say a body. Uh -huh. You are that body. You are that temple. You are that house that God has chose to live in. I, you are I am. We are the body. Body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. You see that? Mm -hmm. yes. None of that pleases God. We think it does. We've been taught to think that it does. But none of that, none of that's ever been pleasing to God. And one of the reasons why is the misappropriation for the word sin. The, the whole Amen. misunderstanding yes. for the word sin. Yes. And you know, as I talked as I talked this morning about <coughs> the misunderstanding of sin, it's not. Uh, it's not what we've been taught and it's a major problem in society and has been for hundreds or thousands of years because sad to say the religious institution has used the misappropriation of that word to do many things to the, to the sheep. Why? Because sheep are gullible. You can do anything with them. Yes. Sheep become people. People are gullible. You can tell them a lie and say it's the truth, and they will buy it. They will believe it, or at least many of them will. But it's coming to a place now because knowledge is being poured out. We're in the age of Aquarius. It's just like it says in Hosea, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth like the yes, waters of the amen. sea. This is what's happening. Yes. This is where we're at. We've crossed this threshold. We've passed through this door. We're not standing on the threshold. Yes. We're not waiting on the door to open. We have gone past it. And one of the things that people are having a problem is coming on through, coming on in. Yes. And they will. It won't be long. They'll begin to come in by the hundreds, by the thousands. It won't be long until you can't keep this flood, this avalanche of people coming in Amen. to the true knowledge yes. that will literally set us free. Yes. Bring us up into the place where God designed us to be. So I wanted to make emphasis on the sin because sin is so misappropriated. And again, there's two words in Greek, two words in Hebrew, two words in Greek. The one word harmatia means offense. That's the, that's the meaning of the word sin in Greek, offense. And that offense means, and here's just, you can look this up. It doesn't matter. If you even have a phone, you want to Google it or ask Siri to tell you. They're they not telling you what Lynn said. They just tell you the true meaning of the word. The word offense means a breach of moral or psychological law or rule. A breach, it means somebody crossed the line. And because all of us have experienced somebody crossing the line, whether it was a moral breach, I'll give you a story, analogy of my oldest daughter. I have three daughters, the oldest daughter, Rochelle. Uh, when, when she was, well, when, when I was, was I 18? I had just turned 19 when she was born. And then I had just turned 20 when the second boat, Tracy, was born. So I, it was kids raising kids, children raising children. That's how it was. So started very young in life. Well, Rochelle, the oldest daughter, when we, when Connie and I, uh, we didn't have a home. We rented a trailer to start with, and then we rented a little house. And the house we rented... We've been married maybe 
three or four years, I guess, something like that, maybe five. We rented this little house, and we lived in this house, and the, the man that owned the house was like a mentor to me. He was like a second daddy to me. His son, he had a boy my age, and he was my best friend, and he was the scout master, the Boy Scout master, which I got involved in the Boy Scouts when I was young and, uh, and you know, loved yeah. the Boy Scout thing. So we rented a house from him, and I didn't think a thing in the world about this, but when Rochelle was probably, I'm going to guess, six, seven, and eight, in my eyes, still a baby, still a baby. But I, I didn't pay any attention to this. I didn't even know this. He, uh, the man that owned the house, he liked to, he lived behind it in a bigger house that he had built, new house, brick house. He would like to come and get Rochelle and let her ride the mower with him while he's mowing the grass. I didn't think nothing about that. And then when Rochelle got 22 year old, she got married. And when she got married, her husband called me and said, what the hell is wrong with Rochelle? I said, I don't know, what do you mean? He said, she don't want me to touch her. And so we got to, okay, I don't know. I'm in the dark here too. And so we got to asking, and Rochelle broke down. And she told us that John sexually abused her for several years. Six, seven, eight year old baby. That's what an offense is. That's what sin is. It wasn't something she did. It was something done to her. Every one of us have received these kind of offenses where moral laws and boundaries are crossed whether they're physical or whether they're psychological it really don't matter sometimes the psychological ones are harder to remove yeah, yeah, yeah. than the physical yeah. ones yeah. so as a result of that i wanted to go i was a pastor i was a pastor at this time i was preaching i i, I had a church and i wanted to go kill that man i mean it's all i could do to keep him go killing that man and he was a mentor to me he was like a daddy to me I mean, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around that. I just wasn't any good for a while. I, I mean, I just, I had my own tire business. I, I pastored a church. And here was my baby girl abused by someone like that. But, you know, again, I'm not one to, I can't throw stones anymore. You still wanted to do that. I wanted to judge. I wanted to condemn. I wanted to burn in hell. I, I almost think I can't do that anymore. I have to let that be. I don't understand that mistake. I do know it was a mistake. My daughter got healed from it, and my daughter went on, thank God. Thank God for that. Many people don't because they don't even know how to take this kind of a sin because, see, the church has made sin playing ball, fixing your hair, church going to church on certain times. They made sin things that have nothing in the world to do with what sin is, so we have such a gross yeah. misunderstanding. Yeah. When we read right. this book and we see sin, we're th oh, the, that alcoholic, that drunk. Yeah. My yeah. God, oh. do you not realize that God, according to religious tradition, destroyed the whole world because of or through Noah and said, I'm going to pick you out because of, okay, you will work. You're the best one on the whole earth. So I'm going to pick you and your boys and y'all's wives and we're going to start this thing over again. I'll kill it and destroy everybody. And the moment God did all of this, Noah gets off the boat. Guess what Noah does? He gets drunk. Here's God's special man to clear one, the only one that can save the whole world, and he's a drunk. Come on. See, we have things that we have not had clear. Things that have not been told right. Stories that we have been supposedly, we've been... It, we've been told to believe are literal and they're not literal. There was never a literal Noah. There was yes. never a literal yes. flood. Yes. There was never a big boat yes. like that. Never! Mm -hmm. Actually, you are that boat. If you take the dimensions of the boat, you'll take the things that went in, whether it had, everybody said, well, he had two. Well, no, the same passage says he had seven. Did he have two of every kind or did he have seven of every kind? Mm -hmm. Challenge you to go back and find out because everything in that whole story is an allegory about you because you are the ark of the covenant. Yes. You are the ark, the boat. Oh, you yes. and I are the ark of God. We are the house. Yes. We're that which is built and put together. And I can go back. I'd like to go back and just show you 
the, the door, the windows, the pitch, the boards, the size, the dimension, the whole thing. It's all allegorical toward you. And so when we come to this sin and we look back, and there's not anything that we can call what was sin, but what wasn't chosen men of God. Look at David. David is the apple of God's eye. David is God's right hand. You know, you have, I'm going to challenge you on this in a minute. How many covenants did God make? How many covenants did God have? Did God finally say, well, that ain't working. Let's make a new one. Hello? We're told that. I show you seven covenants in Scripture. I can show you a David covenant. I can show you a Noahic covenant. I can show you an Abrahamic covenant. I can show you a Moses covenant. I can show you a Davidic covenant. I can show you a Jewish covenant. I can show you what's called a new covenant. Which one of them works? None of them. When you see them that way. Because there is no, no such a thing. Now there is a covenant in which God has with man and that covenant is between you and me. And em emphasis of that covenant is in all of the ones I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have a... Mm -hmm. we have a what do we perish? Why are we destroyed? Lack of knowledge. Yes. You ever heard anybody say the things that I just said? Probably never. Probably never. Isn't that a shame? When this book is full of it? When the, this book is just chucked full of everything I just said? I realize it's a big book, it's a thick book, it's got a whole lot in it, and if once it's broken down, we can begin to look at it and view it accurately, it, it's not so hard. So harmatia, actually the word sin means offense. The other word harmatano, which is used many times, it is an archery term, it simply means you miss the mark. Or it can be like a child who gets up and tries to walk, falls and stumbles, what does he do? Well, stay down, bless God. Now you're a sinner. You ain't ever going to get up. You, might, you fail. Is that how you look at it? You don't look at it like that, do you? Get up and try again. Get up and try. That's the other word for sin. It's an archer. It just it just simply means you missed it. Try it again. It's okay. You got to be mad. Nobody's mad. Nobody's going to hell <laughs> Nobody, nobody's hurt. No. See? And there's a huge difference in these two words. Harmatano, harmatia. Offense, that is actually a mental, mental, I, I can't emphasize that enough, mental claw. A lot of people have mental claws in them that weren't sexually abused as a child. Many have been sexually abused as a child. Hard to ever get past that. I understand it. That's an offense. That's where somebody crossed the boundary of a moral, psychological law. Yeah. And it causes a lot of damage. Causes a lot of, that's what sin. And you think God is mad at that? To, for us to think God is mad at that and say, hey, y'all can offer a sin offering or I'm going to do this, that, and other to clear that up. No, God says, I'm going to come in there and heal that myself. Amen. So that's where God wants us to open our ears and open our eyes and let God come in and let God touch us in these places where the, we need the touch of God, where we need that it's not an offering for sin that's going to peace God. It's not that that's Amen. going to heal you. Yes. <clears throat> doesn't, have, doesn't matter how sweet it smells or how good the barbecue tastes. It doesn't matter. <coughs> so you have those two words. They're used in Greek. Same thing's true in the Hebrew with chata'a and chata'ath. Exactly the same word. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Greek, supposedly New Testament, or Hebrew, Old Testament. Either way. So verse 6, and burnt offerings and sins, offerings, sacrifices for sin, thou had had no pleasure. This said, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written to me to do thy will. And above when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Now here again he's making a, He's making an emphasis on these twice, that these, these offerings that were made had, they had no, uh, they had no bearing on, on God, what God liked or what God didn't like. And so, why are we here? What, what's the purpose for you being here? And I'm going to give you that purpose. It's not complicated. It's actually very simple. The purpose that you are here for is to live. <laughs> and if we're not living, now when I said to live, I meant to be happy, mm -hmm. I meant to be strong, mm -hmm. and I meant to be healthy. That's what life is. Yes. Anything else other than that could be mangled, and, it, and it's not really living. 
So that's what this book is about. This book is about you living. Not just living, but abundantly living. Living above and beyond. That's what, that's what it's all about, is for us to live above and beyond. But you know, we have to go ahead and get things correct and get it right. So I want to put this on the board. I want to go ahead and do my stick man. And again, this stick man represents every human being. And the reason I say that the stick man represents every human being is because this is the embryo in the womb of a mama, in the womb of a woman. And that embryo is built because a seed from the father, which is fire and light, that's what a seed is, that's what a sperm is, it comes out of a male, it's fire, light, plasma, it comes into that egg of the mother, and voila, you're the results of that. And what it starts out, looking like is a worm. It looks like, it just looks just exactly like a worm. Why? It's seven endocrine glands. That's how you get started. You have, huh? You got that. You got to have it in the wrong place. You have got it before. Yeah. Here we go. You're right. Thank you, Beverly. <laughs> I'm glad to see Beverly paying attention. Thank you. And I did my, my heart chakra the heart. I did it. If you notice, y'all notice what that is? Yeah. That's the yin and the yang. Okay? Yeah. And I did that on purpose because this is light and this is dark. That's just true. It's, it's that true in every, every case. This is where light comes from. This is where darkness comes from. Not negative. Don't think about that negative because when you look at a day, a day is, consists of 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. Do you think the 12 hours of day are enhanced more or less because of the 12 hours of darkness? No. They are there by perfect design. Nothing wrong with them. So the stick man represents every human being, everybody. And what is the whole purpose of it? To live. To have life. To have abundant life. And to have life more abundantly. Now I want to give you a little Hebrew Lesson right here. Let me clear that up a little bit there. I don't want that. Wow. That marker's not going to come off very good for some reason. Now, for those of you that don't know, this is what's called the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. This is called the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. You ever heard of the Tree of Life? I'm sure you have. Everyone else has heard of the Tree of Life, whether it's in Genesis chapter 2 or over in the book of Revelation. You've all heard of the Tree of Life. And the Tree of Life, it's leaves are for the healing of the nation and it's actually so it has 12 on each side which represents the astrological wheel and all that it entails and all the stuff that's there so this is called the Kabbalistic tree of life and again this tree and the stick man are the same thing this is called crown or the keter it always represents God at the top this is called uh, chokma masculine male and this is called bina feminine female and all of this is what you and I call the triune God the three in one you all heard of that? that's the three in one and so that represents that that represents your head you know why? because you see up here in your head you have three in one yeah. You have a male and female hemisphere to your brain. Yeah. You have a pineal gland, which actually represents the eye of God, the crown of God. In, in Hebrew, it's called ayin. Mm -hmm. Actually means the eye that God sees through. And Jesus said this, actually in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, when your eye is what? Single. Single. He wasn't talking about these two eyes. Yeah. He's talking about this eye. In other words, when you see through the eye of God, 
Yes. With your physical body, yes. you realize you're the house, you're the temple, so God has to have something to look out through. And we think God looks through these. No, God don't see through these eyes. God sees through this eye, the pineal gland. That's called ayin in Hebrew. Yeah. And it's the eye of God. So this trinity is represented as that. So this is, this is a, a one. You have one, two, three, four, five. Boy, it's really getting with it, isn't it? Six and seven. These are seven endocrine glands, seven chakras. This is the physical body being built, growing in the womb of the mother. And this is the Kabbalistic tree of life. You have three. These represent the triune aspect of God. And then you have the male, the female. Uh, and so this would be... Uh, uh, this is one, this would be two, and this would be number three, and then this would be four, and these right here would be five, six, seven. So to take this tree, this made up of ten, what they call sephirots. The word sephirot in Hebrew actually means emanation. It means it's just coming forth or coming out. It's taken from Genesis chapter 1 and the word said. The Hebrew word said, S-I-D. Now, you have to remember, I mean, this is hard. I know it's hard, but I, I say it. God is not a man. Numbers, I think it's yeah. Numbers uh, 21. I think it's what the passage. God is not a man. Well, and I can take you to New Testament. Hebrew, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, God is, now listen, to this. God is, God is not a man, God is a consuming fire. 1 John, God is love. Okay, then what is God? Well, God is love. Uh, God is a consuming fire. Well, God is energy. I take you to Psalms 46. God is the Son, S-U-N. That's what it says. And shield. Yes. That's what God is. I'm telling you things that the scripture says God is as opposed to things God is not. Yes. What has religion made God to be? Religion has made God to be a man in the image of man. That's what they have. So what have they told you? Somewhere out yonder in the sky is an old gray-headed man with a long white beard that's just waiting to shake your hands and you made it. <laughs> Look, I'm glad you made it. I tell you, you didn't. Scripture doesn't say that. Scripture said God is not a man. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm trying to get it to crack, pull out that plug in the ear, pull that thing off the eye. We can see God is not a man. We've made God through religion in our image, a judgmental God. Like we're judgmental. A critical God. Like we're critical. An angry God. Like we're angry. That is not God. God never was that. God never will be that. God is love. Love. God is power. Energy. All of these things. God is not in one particular place. God is in every place. He's not a man sitting on a throne out yonder in glory. Yes, yes. Yes, right. <laughs> I know that's difficult and hard. I really do. I know it. I know I, I grapple with it myself before I ever would dare say it. I know I'd sit and I'd get I'd study these Hebrew words. I'd look at all oh, God. I'd get angry and I'd throw my Bible on the floor and I'd face God. That ain't right. How come they do you know? So I've grappled years and years over some of this stuff. Now it just flows freely because it's not a big deal. I see it. I see it now. But I didn't see it then when I was trying to see it. I was grappling with it. Mm -hmm. And so these are things I can just go on and on. What God is and what God is not. Mm -hmm. God is not what religion has told us God is. Mm -hmm. yeah. God is you know the Hebrew mm -hmm. You remember in the Old Testament when it says, And the wrath of God was kindled against them. <laughs> Do you know the word wrath in Hebrew is off? A-F. It's the word off. Alifei. And you know what that word means? passion like the passion of a man loving a woman and you know what they translate that wrath and you know how that they cut they untranslate the 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 english angry that's why people get so confused they say well the god of the old testament 
But I tell you, he was pretty angry. He was upset. He was going to kill anything and everybody. Oh, that just burns me up so many times. I think, no. Jesus is not serving a God that's different from the Old Testament than the one from the New Testament. Because God's not appeased by your sacrifice. I mean, how many places do you have to see that? God's not satisfied by blood or by shedding of blood. God's not satisfied by you drinking the blood of Jesus or eating the flesh of Jesus. That's cannibalism. Amen. God's so upset against that. God doesn't, God's not interested in that. That's religion. That's what we do. That's yes. what man does. That's what we have built. We built that God, and we yeah. tried to make that God in our image. That's backwards. We are as the image of God, and that image is love and power and forgiveness and ability and all of the other attributes that are of God. Yes. That's who we are. Not filled with fear, not filled with anger, not filled with blame, not filled with shame. God's not trying to blame anybody for anything. That don't mean that people don't make horrendous mistakes. It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean this. No matter how big or how horrendous they are, God can still take them into Himself, still love them, and still get them further on down the road. And I realize that's hard because some people will die in their pain. A big, big portion of humanity will die in their pain. Say it. That just simply means to emanate. God is not a man. God does not have vocal cords. God don't stand on mountains and say, Hey, y'all. <laughs> in Southern or in any other language. The only mountain God stands on is the mountain of your heart inside you. Yes. If you're in a conversation with God, it's inside you. Paul makes it very clear. It's Christ in you. Amen. It's not a Christ out yonder. It's not one out there in glory. It's the Christ Amen. in you. Yes. Amen. You've got to get in touch with that. You've got to do that. Nobody can do that for you. No preacher can translate that. No preacher can be the emissary between you and that. Amen. Only you can do that yourself. Yes. Only, only I can see this for me. I can't see it for you. Now, I can present it. I can show it in many different ways and fashions. Praying to God that we can see what is or what it is God is saying. Yeah. And God is saying a lot. And God has not said a lot. God's been accused of saying. Yes. <laughs> God has done a lot. God's been accused of doing. Okay. And then we have another one that I want to put up over here. Most people aren't too often familiar with this one. This one is called uh, the Ankh. And what Ankh means in Egypt is life. Mm. But the Sephirotic tree of life means in Hebrew is life. What the stick man means in life is life. It's about life. God is wanting us to live and live more abundantly that yes. we might be able to uh, enjoy, be happy, be strong, and be healthy. That's what God wants us to experience. That's what He does. That. And so as a result of though, all of these wonderful and marvelous things that God has done, understanding what sin is or what sin is not, uh, I wanted to read you some things that I wrote about this. The stick man, for instance, this little character. I've done so much teaching and preaching on this over the last 20 years. It's, you know, it's a lot of it would probably be it would probably be monotonous for some of you. But to say that I, I got this out of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, but it unfolded all the way to the other end of the Bible in the book of Genesis, because I'm a I'm a Hebrew. Enthusiast and the Hebrew buff, I, I just feast on the Hebrew. And so out of Genesis, this is called the Hebrew uh, Y-O-W-M, Yom. And that word Yom is translated in Hebrew in many, many places for the word life. And, uh, and that's what the word means. It, and the word Yom represents life. It's spelt in Hebrew, it's spelt backwards, sort of like this. It's spelt with the, the Yod, 
the wav, and the final mem, yod wav mem. And what the word has to do, it has to do with male and female. That's what the yod stands for. The, male, the yod, or yod in Hebrew, the yod, or the yod, is representative of the number 10. The number 10 is representative of number 1, which is God, or the male, 5. And the, the 0 is representative of duality, 1, 2, duality. And it represents the feminine or the female. So you have the male and the female. You have God and man. And it's all designed to just be one. Always. It's God's all, everything God has created, God has designed it for it to be one with it. Not to be one away from it. Not to be one separate from it. There's not anything living that's not living because of the God that's in it. That's the only thing that can live it. I don't care if it's a tree. I don't care if it's a bug. I don't care what it is. The only reason it has life in it is because it has God in it because God is yes. energy, power, life. Yes. God is life. Yes. So this Hebrew word yom, but in Genesis it got translated for this word right here. D-A-Y. And so we build an entire religion on seven days and then begin to worship the seven days. And I guarantee you, you can't ask a bug a cow, a horse, a dog, a cat, a tree. You can't ask anything in creation what day of the week it is. Well, they don't know. Because there ain't no special day. Paul even made it very clear. There ain't no such thing as a special day or a special holiday. Every one day is like another day. But what did we do? We broke it down. We took that beautiful Hebrew word, yom, that meant life, facets of life, abundant life, long life, happy life, used that way, but yet in Genesis 1, when they begin to give us what we call the creation story, yeah. because it is that, but it's a creation story that's actually broken down into four facets. yod hay vav hay four facets, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. The four gases, what is it? Uh, uh, anacyne, help me out, Kirby. A, 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 anacyne, S, T, and G. I think, I think those are the four. You can Google it. You can find it. Everything, everything that exists is made up of these four. What is the four gases? That's yod heh vav -Hey. You know how we translated that word, don't you? Jehovah. We put, we put vowel signs in it. Put a vowel, O and A. Yeah. We come up word word Jehovah. And then we made Jehovah into a character, a man like us. When Jehovah actually were the four gases, the four chemicals, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, that God had created, put here in the earth, to take those and mix them together. And when he mixes this ingredient together, he puts it all together like eggs and flour and salt and butter, puts it in the oven, mama's womb, cooks it. Whoa, we got a cake. We got a human. We got you. That's what this is, the stick man, y'all. And the reason I did him with the, with the yin and the yang at the heart because it represents the duality of light and dark. Yeah. Light and dark. Did you realize that the duality has three representatives? The trinity, that's one, has three representatives. Light, and you say, how did you get that? Well, I'll get it this way. Uh, I'll show you how I got it. Light. That's one. And, that's two. Dark. That's three. One, two, three. And you know what's the most important one in them? The most important one is not the light. The most important one is not the dark. The most important one is that one. Is that one. The and. That's God. It's God that holds everything together. It's God that pulls everything together. Yeah. It's God that keeps everything, everything together. together. Yeah. It's God that makes the two one. That's the only marriage there ever has been. And that marriage, no man can pull asunder. Amen. That's right. Amen. And yes. we just leave it out. That's exactly what this is right here. This is light. This is darkness. This is and. 
<laughs> it's the heart. It's the heart. That's where you find God in the leb. Hebrew yes. leb. Heart. It's God in the heart. That's where you commune with Him. That's where you... Now we, tell, we come over here and we look at this onk. This onk, this Hebrew Kabbalistic tree of life, and this stick man, the endocrine system, all represent the same exact thing. They represent the circle. The, the thing about the onk, the purpose for the circle was it meant time less ness time less ness no time that's the reason I draw all these in a circle they all represent no time why because that's what our word eternity or eternal represents that's what the word means in 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 real vernacular it means timelessness there's no time in that well, guess what? God, timeless, eternal, puts itself where? Yeah. In time. Yeah. So guess what the and is in? The and is in the middle of a tension. And the tension's not right or wrong. The tension's not good or bad. The tension's not uh, evil versus good. The tension just simply is there. It's there for creation. It's there uh, for divine purpose. You see this? So you have timelessness. You know what this line represents? This line represents the horizon, and this line, line represents the vertical of night and day. And so when you, when you do them in this fashion, the same thing, that symbol's on the majority of old ancient churches everywhere because they understood the symbol. They understood the onk. They understood if he brought it in this way, what this symbol represents. This one represents time. So what do you have? You have timelessness in time. What is that? That's God manifest in the flesh. Amen. Not as just one person. Yes. One individual. Yes. But as everything. Yes. yes. God yes. manifest in the flesh. So how far is God? I mean, He's closer than your brother. He's the breath you breathe. Yes. He's the heart, the beat. You yeah. can feel it, you can hear it. That's how close he is. <laughs> he is you. God is you. Yes. You is God. God is love in the flesh. God is love in the flesh. God is power in the flesh. Yeah, God are all these things. So, all right, here we are. Let's go back over to John. I mean, back over to Hebrews here. I think that's where we're at. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 8, and above when he says, Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings for sin you did not, neither had pleasure, which are offered by the law. Then said I, now watch this, this is a tricky passage. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, I come to do their will. Then said I, I come to do thy will. He taketh away the first. If you have an annotated Bible or no reference Bible, what most likely it's going to say over here to the side is this. It's most likely going to say the first covenant. And I would have to ask you a question if you're going to say that. I would have to say, which first covenant? The, the Adamic covenant? I mean, that's probably the first one. And you're, you, you're not thinking, what do you mean the Adamic? You mean God had a covenant? Yeah, God had a covenant with man. Adam and Eve. Yeah. Or was it the Noahic covenant? Did God have a covenant with Noah? Yeah, yeah, God had a covenant with Noah. Oh, I bet you're thinking the Mosaic covenant. Maybe the third or fourth one come along. So that's what, if it says right here, it takes away the first. Now, y'all are looking and digging, aren't you? Hallelujah. That's a good thing if you're looking and digging. Great covenant. Taking away the first. Notice that. He's taking away the first. Well, actually, the word here in the Greek is protos. And it means foremost. It has to do with time and place. So what is he saying? I'm going to take away this the aspect of your time and the aspect of your positionality in place. That's what he's going to take away first. Your thoughts on what time is. It's like it's like uh, I was teaching. I said you're only as old as you think you are. You know, I always tell everybody I'm 49. And then when Rochelle, my oldest daughter, she got to be 54, she said, "Daddy, you're in denial." I said, "Okay, I'll be 59." <laughs> so I mean you know what, what is that you know 
That's what this means. That's what it, it's talking about taking away the first. It ain't got nothing to do with the first covenant as opposed to the second covenant. He said, I'm going to take away your, your concept of time and place or of importance. That's what the word means. Protos. Just look it up. I know what you got to do. Look it up. And then he said, but I'm going to, that I may take away the first and I may establish the second. And everybody just adds covenant to it and it ain't got nothing to do with the covenant. Second, actually the word deutoros actually means second in time, place, and rank. So hold, hold your place right here. We're going to probably come back. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 15. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, and I verse 42. This is uh, probably the most chopped up, misunderstood passage of scripture in the Bible. At least one of them. There's so many. There's so many it's ridiculous, but this is one of them where the religion and songs have built all kinds of stupid ideas in our heads and we believe them and we hold on to them and I remember years ago when I would question Dake about some of the things that sounded so stupid to me I'd say well Dake what are they going to do with all these people that died out in the ocean for years and years through wars and different things or died and they just buried out there or fell in water, and the fish all eat them up yeah, I said how are they going to raise up out of, the, out of this dirt grave out there in the field I said, what about all these people that's burned up in houses or in where people have burnt whole, yeah. whole subdivisions or take some traditions of the American Indians, many of them, they just burnt them. I said, what are you going to do with all them burnt people? Mm -hmm. And old Dave said, pump food and ain't got too many questions. <laughs> and I would say, oh, I want to know. I want to know these things now. He said, you ain't going to know until you get to heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's this now? Is this... Stay close with me. It says, verse 42, so also is the resurrection. That's the Greek word, anastasis. And actually it means to stand up after you've been asleep. That's all it means. It means to stand up after you've been yeah. asleep. I think most of y'all do that. <laughs> I hope you do. I hope we do. I hope you do. I hope you stand up and go to the bathroom after you've been asleep. I hope you don't just lay there and wet on yourself. I realize you could, but I'd rather you didn't. That's what that word means. Resurrection. Don't you think that's a pitiful way to describe that word? Stand up. Uh, Y'all stand up. That's what, so there's, there it is. So, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The dead just simply means those that are separated from themselves by the ideas of religion. That's all, that's all that's referring to. If you stand up from that, stand up away from that. It's sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It was sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body and it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body and they are together in your body. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. You can, you can put your emphasis on whichever one you would like. If you put your emphasis on your spiritual body that is eternal, that will begin to empower you, that will begin to free you, that will begin to deliver you, that will begin to heal you, it's your spiritual body that wants you. Natural body will not do those things. It can't. It can only be the recipient, the receiver of those. It's just exactly like your mind or your ego. It longs to be trained and taught. And if you don't train it and teach it, it will be like a spoiled brat. It'll make you silly and sick and deep and mm -hmm. this and that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we see it all the time. Yeah. We, are, we are a part of it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, here we go, this is taken away the first, was made a living soul, and the last was made a quickening spirit. So be it that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual, which is the one he's going to establish, the second which is afterwards. He's taken away the first, the control of the time element in your life, so that he may establish the second, the spiritual man, establish that truth in your life. Mm -hmm. That's right. oh, Howbeit, verse 46, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, he's earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, as is the earthy. 
such are they also that are earthly, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. As we have bore, the word bore in Greek is for an A-O, and it means to wear just like you're wearing your clothes. And notice what it says. I'm going to say it that way. As we wear the image of the earthy. That's what you're doing right now. You're wearing the image of the yeah. earthy. He said, as we wear the image, it says we shall. You should just mark that completely out of your Bible because you shall not ever get there. Because shall always projects it's in the future yes. or in the past. Yes. It's what you should and could. Mm -hmm. It ain't. It ain't. No. You. It says uh, we bore the image of the earthy. And let us also. Let us also. That if you want to mark out, you shall and put let us. If you look it up in the Greek, I challenge you. Look it up in the Greek. That's exactly what it's going to tell you. It's not something you shall do. It's something you need to do. Let yes. us. Notice what it said. Let us, the word bear and bore is the same identical Greek word. Let us also put on the clothes of the image of the heavenly, the spiritual man. Wear the, wear the clothes. So there's your first and there's your second. He's going to take you out of the time of the earthly. He's going to put you in the time of the divine and the spiritual. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. So go with me to John chapter 1. I'm going to try to just unhook this. Wind down or whatever. Circle the air for it. John chapter 1. Oh, hallelujah. I want to. It's about life. It's all. Everything it is, it is about life. Yes. Everything in time. We're going way back to Egypt. Andy and I, when we went to. We went to Egypt to see the pyramids and spent, gosh, we spent happy days with that. 10 or 12. 10. Well, you see this everywhere in all of the monuments, in all of the yeah. temples. The Ankh is everywhere. You see it in all kinds of Egyptian art. You'll see the, the man and the woman, and they'll always be holding the Ankh. They'll have their hand in here, yes. this, and they'll be holding the Ankh. It's the symbol of life. That's the reason they had And it carried over into, uh, into Hebrew Kabbalah, and it's symbolized in this what I call the Kabbalist, it is the Kabbalistic tree of life, it, and it carries over into the stick man, which is the endocrine glands that build the function of the physical body. All of them represent life and the quality of life that God is. Yeah. You is. You are. So. Not will be. Not will be. No, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about what you will be. I'm talking about who you are right yes, now. Yes. Who you are right now. So. <laughs> I'll read you just a couple of things here to lay the background to. The, these, the things I want to read to you are these things I wrote right here. That's the main thing I want you to hear. It's not necessarily what this writer said, but he makes some really good points. He says, in, in, But India cares not for the idea of the, process, of the process of growth, condemns the nature in whose body spiritual growth must have its roots. <coughs> Can you hear that? Most religions do. They want you to grow spiritually out there, not here. That's not where you grow. You grow in the environment you're in. If you don't grow in the environment you're in, you don't grow. It's like you're not going to take a seed of an oak tree to heaven and plant it up there and it grow. It won't grow. That's not the environment it's designed to grow in. The Spirit's designed to grow in this environment. Yet in Indian philosophy, or Hindu philosophy, that's just basically what he's saying, in Hindi, Hindu philosophy, as well as in a lot of messed up English philosophy, American philosophy, <clears throat> we want to do away with the ego. Destroy it. Kill it. Yeah. Get rid of it. You get rid of your ego, you get rid of your sensual apparatus. Then you won't be able to see, smell, taste, touch, feel, hear. That's what the ego does. That's exactly the very thing that soul is designed to attach to. The soul is attached to the ego just exactly like a leech attaches to something. It becomes one with it. So he said, India cares not for the, for the idea of the process of growth. It condemns the nature in whose body spiritual growth must have its roots and utterly disregards the need of time for the perfection of conscious life. That's powerful. You have a need for this element. 
But this element of time is not to rule you. Yes. You have a need for the body, but the body is not to master you. Yes. You have a need for the things that you have, but they're not to control you. Right. They are to be an expression of you. They're so you can express the best out of taste, so that you can experience the best out of your emotions. Not so that you can have a fit. India disagrees flat, flatly with all of the process of life manifest as the cosmic purpose and the means and the methods of its universal achievement and hotly seeks some way of obliterating it all from consciousness. Since it finds itself thwarted in its effort to obliterate the external world, it flies to the only possible alternative, the destruction of consciousness. <clears throat> I wrote a note right here. Well, let me read, let me read his, his next line. He says, And even when it is forced to co concede a modem of value to life, it does so on the premises that such value is realized in the education of the ego. That I agree with. The ego comes from the Latin ego. It also comes from the Greek ego. Same same word in both, both places and both cases. And you know what the ego means? It means the self. It means the capital I. It means that part of you which feels, acts, and thinks. That part of you which feels, acts, and thinks. The I, the, these are things that I wrote. The I, the self, is that which is the treasure that's hid in the field. It is the pearl. Of great price. It is the I, the self, that must grow up into the head. It is the gold that must be purified seven times. It is the Christ that must be awakened. It is the diamond in the rough. It is not that which you must kill and are destroyed, but that which you must nourish and train and grow and educate and teach the knowledge of wisdom and understanding. This is wisdom. This is understanding. You see this little dot, 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 dot that I put right here? That's even in that tree. It's there, but many times you can't see it. That's why I put it there, because it's, it's, it's there, but it's not there. This is the and. This word, day ought, is used in the book of Proverbs more than any other words. used more <coughs> than wisdom and understanding. Do you know what that word is in day ought in Hebrew? That word is knowledge. It's the lack of knowledge. It is a window that's in your soul. It is the door of your heart. It is that place which you seek to open God to gain the knowledge that you can work the wisdom and the understanding. Least you be like Job said, you can be a wise old fool and then your understanding is nothing. Hmm. That which you must nourish and train and grow and educate and teach the knowledge of wisdom and understanding. It is your ego, yourself, the I, the I am. When Moses met God on the mountain, who did God say that Moses met? I, I am. ego, am. It meant timelessness in time. The I am, the self, the I am. It is your ally, not your enemy. It is your inner child that needs to be trained, educated, not destroyed and killed. Yes. And that's you know that's what we have to have an awakening to. It is that inner child. You know, and I wanted to get to John, but I just I'm just going to quit here. I, there's so much more here that I want to unfold, but it's just too much. <laughs> too much. It just it's too big. Too big. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. so I'll just, uh, just if you have just, any questions John, or comments. Just uh, make mention of John about the was and the is. Okay. Let, let, if you're there, John 1 1. For instance, I will say this about John. The thing that created the stick man, the thing that created the tree, the thing that created the onk is the life of God and that life of God comes forth in seed everybody say seed. seed in seed form 
And since I'm saying that about the seed, I'm going to tell you about a dream I had three, four, five weeks ago. It was just a childish dream. It kind of, I kind of wanted to where I was at about. But I, I'm thinking it's when uh, we were planting back here our garden about that time and I was grappling with them seeds to get them to come out of this pitiful poor dirt. <laughs> get out there. What can we do there? Anyway, I had this dream. I, and uh, I woke up and I was under the dirt. I was, I was in the dirt. And I saw these seeds. They were just dropped and they were just all different ways they dropped and fell. And then the, the dirt was covered over and there they were. They were just laying there in the sea. And all of a sudden, I mean, all of a sudden out of the blue, they just began to twitch and turn and move. I thought, wow, look at that. And all of a sudden it got positioned. And with one seed, all of a sudden I saw this root shoot down. About the same time I saw this sprout shoot up. And I thought, whoa, look at that. And then I realized the seed was being pulled apart as it began to swell because I thought, well, it's not dying. Mm. Everybody said it has to die. Like, you know, Jesus said, unless the seed fall on the ground and die. But we never looked up that word die to see what it means. Nobody ever decided. Well, I did. And I said, wow, look at this. Paul said this. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. He said, knowledge, they ought, and knowledge Puffs up. That's what I saw those seeds do. The first thing before before the shoot come out the uh, at the top, the, at the top, and the root come out the bottom, it just began to swell up from the moisture in the soil, the the warmth in the. It swelled it up. It didn't die. It metamorphosed. It all of a sudden changed its life form, and its life form just it. Went down and it went up. It's like something's pulling it apart. You ever felt that you've been there? <laughs> pulling it apart. And I seen that and I thought, oh, okay. Knowledge does that to you as a seed of God. That's what it does. Yeah. And so, right here, yes. John 1 1 says, in the beginning. That is not like Genesis 1 1 in the beginning. Everybody reads it that way, but it's the Greek word archaeos. Which actually means the first principles. Or it means first place. The first principle, the first place that you get to in the th when you're three or four year old is you begin to learn your ABCs. You begin to count. One, two, three, four. Those are first principles. That's first place. That's what this, that's what this says. It says in the beginning is. The word was is how it's read. That's wrong. See, God never was. God never will be. God is. God's always present. When we put God was, then we put God back in the Old Testament doing things that we read about back then, but God ain't doing them today. When we could put God will be, we put God out in the future somewhere out in heaven where maybe we'll get to be there and do it. But that's never ever true. God always is. Yes. God is yes. a present help yes. in the time. God is, not was. So when you read it, first principle is... The what? The word. It comes from the Greek word logos, which comes from the root word lego. Have you ever heard of that word? Lego? Mm -hmm. What is a lego? A lego is a little plastic toy that you put them together and they can build yeah. all kinds of yeah. things. Mm -hmm. That's what the word logos is. It's the That's seeds good. that will put together and build. Oh, you. yes. Mm. it'll build you mm. and you can read this book and I did it years ago did an exegesis on this yeah. book and everywhere I put seen was I marked it out Ever, everywhere I would see should or shall